Oh, what a sweet time of prayer. Amen, church? So good to pray with the body of Christ and pray for each other's needs. Particularly helpful this morning, especially as we're going to look at God's Word today. Uh, well, my name is Glenn Bakel. I'm a pastor in New England, uh, actually here on vacation right now. I'm originally from this area, uh, from Southern California, um, and I'm actually uh, pretty good friends with, with Paul. We went to college together. Um, we were in each other's weddings because we couldn't find better people to be our best men. Um, known him for a long time. It's a real joy to be here. Uh, I don't know if you knew this about Pastor Paul, but he actually has two bachelor's degrees. Yeah, he's got his and he has mine. Um, we went to college again, obviously. We went with roommates and stuff. And, and I wasn't necessarily the most disciplined guy on the planet when it came to studying. And so he would start his uh, papers and he'd be working weeks in advance while I'm busy playing video games or going out on dates with this really cute girl I'd met who's now my wife. Um, and he'd always be nagging me like my mom. Glenn, when are you going to do your paper? When are you going to do your paper? Okay, mom, I'll do it. And I would finally do it. Um, we would sit down uh, before a big exam. And this is usually what I would do with Paul. I would sit down and say, hey, Paul, um, here's what I want you to do. Let's pretend I didn't go to any of these classes. Why don't you tell me everything I need to know to pass this exam? And so we would have our late night study sessions. Now, I did this for his good, of course, right? Because by teaching it and by, uh, it, by, by running through it with, with me, it helped solidify for him all the content he needed to know. So I was really looking out for Paul. And, and lest you think uh, he was always this perfect academic individual, all of his study habits changed when he met this blonde girl that was way out of his league. And so... Got to return the favor a little bit there. Really, it's been a joy to know Paul. You guys are really blessed to have Paul as your pastor more than you know. And so I just want to throw that out there. Here at Not Avenue Christian Church, uh, there is this expectation that we are going to hear from God. I share that expectation this morning. And it's not because... The pastors here, the elders here, are spe uh, particularly special spokespersons for God. It's not because I uniquely have God's ear and, and God's voice, but it's because we're going to be in this book. We are going to be in God's Word. We're going to turn to it. We're going to open to it. And together, we're going to gather around this book, and we're going to hear from our Father in heaven. And so if you have a, a copy of God's Word with you, I'd encourage you to turn to James. And I believe if you don't own a copy of God's Word, uh, I think uh, they have them in the back for you. Go get up, go get one, and if you don't own it, just take it home. It's a gift from Pastor Paul. He's going to personally pay for it. So take as many as you want. Take them for your friends. It's not coming out of my wallet. But go ahead and take a copy of God's Word and turn there to the book of James. We'll be in chapter 5. And as you're turning there, I just have, wanted to use this as an opportunity to make an important announcement. I'm going to soon be leaving vocational ministry because I have come across an amazing opportunity. You see, a couple weeks back, I got an email from a Nigerian prince. And he told me, he told me if, it, it, he, see, he's trying to work his money around. I guess they don't have banks in Nigeria. So he's trying to transfer money over here. And so he says he needs my bank account information. And all I do is send that to him. He's going to transfer a bunch of money in my account so he can transfer it somewhere else. And he's going to leave me with several million dollars so I can go ahead and retire now. Isn't that a great, great thing? Uh, how many of you received an email like that before? Okay, you have, right? And what do you do with those emails? You delete them. And the reason you delete them is because you don't believe it's going to work. Right? You don't, you don't really believe that there's some guy who just wants to hand you millions of dollars to help him out. But if you did believe that, if you truly believe that he really was going to give you this money if you helped him, what would you do? You would do whatever it takes to help him because you are going to get free money. Right? Who, who would benefit from a couple million dollars in your bank account? I would say most of us would. And so we would do whatever we could to help this guy because we would believe him, but we don't believe him. But here's the thing this morning. We tend to treat prayer like a Nigerian prince email. Right? We, we, we don't pray as often as... As we ought to. And the reason we don't pray as often as we ought to is ultimately because we doubt it's going to work. Because if we truly believed that we had the ear of God and we can make requests known to Him, what would we do? 
we'd be praying all the time. We'd be praying constantly. But I think sometimes we don't believe it works. And we might not outright call it a scam, but we delete it nonetheless. And so if you're taking notes this morning uh, and you're going to write down one thing, here's what I want you to write down. The big idea from the text this morning is this. A working faith prays because the prayer of faith works. Let me say that again. A working faith prays because the prayer of faith works. One of the main themes in the book of James has been that true faith in Jesus always results in action. If you receive the message of the gospel that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the dead, if you receive that reality, it's going to radically change your life and you are going to do things differently. You're going to live differently. You're going to work things out differently because of what you now believe. And so James has been encouraging through the whole book that t- t- encouraging us to see our faith result in action. And the final action James wants to see the church fully engaged in is before he closes this important book is that of prayer. He wants to see the church fully engaged in prayer. And the reason he wants us to pray is because he knows our prayers work. They actually do something. So with that in mind, let's look at verse 13 of James chapter 5. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. So James begins his exhortation to us to pray by telling us first what kind of situations are worth praying about. When, in other words, when is it a good time to pray? And he lists really two times we should be praying. The first is times of suffering. And by suffering, James means any kind of distress or any kind of hardship that we might face. So I don't know if you remember from back in James chapter 1 where James told the church to rejoice when? Whenever you face various trials, right? Anytime you're facing various kinds of trials, you should be praying. It's those very trials James has in mind when he says, if you're suffering, if you're facing those trials, what should you do? You should be praying. We should talk to God about our trouble and all of our trouble. Do you think there's any trouble or any suffering or any trial we're facing that is too small to bring before God? No. In fact, James would have us pray about every single trouble we face, even the most insignificant, small things, things that we would think, oh, that should not be on God's radar. Those are the very things James is saying, no, we should be praying about this, right? So if you're sitting in traffic and traffic is terrible, I know, uh, again, I'm from New England right now, where we're living, we don't have traffic like we have here in Southern California. And so I know you guys, maybe you face a little bit of traffic periodically, I'm not sure. Um, But if you're in traffic and it's terrible, what does James want you to do? You should pray about it. You should pray about it. What if you had a little, a little fight with your spouse? Nothing big, just a little mild disagreement. What should you do? You should pray about it. What if you have a cold? Just the sniffles. Should you pray about something like that? Absolutely. What if you spill something on your favorite shirt? We don't usually pray about something like that. Would James say, go ahead and pray for those things? He would. He would have us pray about even the most insignificant things. And of course, when we face Huge, massive trials and suffering. What should we do? We should pray and bring it before God. I don't know about you, but for me, it is times of trials that drive me to prayer quicker than anything else. Right before we started vacation, we, uh, the, the, the two weeks before we left, um, it was probably the hardest two weeks of my entire ministry. Uh, we had, uh, it was a very hectic couple weeks. Obviously, I'm preparing to uh, leave on vacation for several weeks. Um, and we have our VBS kicking off during that time. And, and I'm participating in all of that. And right in the middle of all of that, uh, a buddy of mine, uh, his wife just didn't wake up. They have three kids. Oldest is 10, youngest is two. And she just, they have no idea what happened. She just died. Did a lot of weeping, a lot of grieving through that time. And I was absolutely drained as we're trying to meet the needs and, 
and work through all this and still do ministry. But guess what, guess what I experienced in those moments? Guess, guess what I was driven to do more often than I normally do? To pray. Because I knew I was absolutely bankrupt. I couldn't do it. And I knew these, these friends who were grieving were absolutely bankrupt. They, are, they were on their face, and I was driven to prayer. I find it's easier to pray, isn't it, sometimes when we're suffering. We're reminded of our great need before God. But there's another set of circumstances James wants, wants us to pray in that we aren't as uh, quick to pray for. You see what it is there in verse 15? Or 13, rather? We are to also pray during times of cheer. He says, is anyone cheerful? Let him offer praise to God. And really, what is, what, what is it to sing praise? It's to declare to God his goodness and his grace and, and, be, and show your gratitude for what he's done for you. And really, what is that? That's prayer. Right? So the right response to the times, the good times, is also to pray. And it's the times we're often most forgetful in regard to prayer. I'm on vacation right now, which means I wake up whenever I please. I roll out of bed. I lie down next to a pool and watch my kids play. And guess what? My prayer time has taken a hit as a result. I, I need James's encouragement here to pray and be grateful to God for rest and for the good things and for my family. But we're, we're called to rejoice during these times of cheer. And, and what kinds of good things ought we offer up praise to God for? Just the big things, right? No. Even the little things. Just like we, there's no trouble too small to bring before God. There is no good thing too small to thank God for. You lost your car keys and then you found them. What should you do? Pray and thank God for helping you find your keys. You got to use a coupon at the store that was expired. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. Even the little things, James would say, offer up praise to God. Thank him for what he has done, even in every time of joy. Right? James even says back in chapter 1, verse 17, that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. Right? So if every good gift and every perfect gift is from God, when should we be thanking him for every good gift and every perfect gift? Even the little ones we're called to offer up praise before our Father in heaven. So James is really saying this. When should we be praying? All the time. The good times and the bad. However, when we consider praying at all times, the categories we usually think in are in that of individualistic kind of private terms, right? We should pray at all times in our head or in the car when we're by ourselves. But I think James envisions that we would pray not just by ourselves, but with each other. Look what he says in verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. So should you ask others to pray for you? Yes. You should ask others to pray for you. And as an example, James uses... Uh, instructs rather those who are sick to call for the spiritual leaders of the church, the elders, and anoint them with oil and pray. Now, what, what's the deal with this oil? Well, it's by anointing a person with oil, it's just kind of a, a special way to set this person apart and say, we're devoting this individual to prayer. There's nothing magical or mysterious about the oil. It was simply a way to designate we are pouring our prayers on this person like we poured oil on him. Does this passage promise us healing every single time? That as long as we get the elders into a room and force them to squirt some vegetable oil on our head, we can guarantee a healing. Is, is that something this text promises? I don't think so for two different reasons. First, James, again, has been talking about rejoicing in the various trials that we face. And if simply praying every time gets you out of that trouble... Why wouldn't James at the beginning of his book say, hey, guys, if you, whenever you face trials of many kinds, just pray about them and they'll go away. That's not what he says, right? He says rejoice in those times because those are the times God's going to use those trials for your good. And so sometimes God leaves 
suffering and pain in our lives to produce in us the character of Christ. But secondly, it's not just any prayer that's going to bring about healing, but what kind of prayer? What does he say? Prayer of what? You see it in your text? The prayer of what? Faith. So only a certain kind of prayer is going to be effective. And by prayer of faith, I don't think he means that if you believe really, really strongly, it's going to happen. So the Apostle Paul, would you say he was a man of faith? Absolutely. He, he would have a greater faith than you and I. Wouldn't you agree to that? The Apostle Paul, though he had a greater faith than you and I, he struggled with what he called a thorn in his flesh, and God wouldn't remove it. Does that mean Paul had a weak faith? I don't think so. When he's writing to his protege, Timothy, and Timothy had been having some stomach issues, guess what Paul tells him? I want you to drink a little wine. It's going to help you settle your stomach and deal with it. Well, why wouldn't Paul just say, hey, make sure you go get that healed real quick so you can keep going? Paul also struggled with eyesight issues, right? And so all these things aren't a result of Paul having a deficient faith. He had a strong faith, but God had a different purpose in what was going on. And so what does James mean by prayer of faith? Well, simply this. The prayer of faith is a prayer trusting God to do what's best in a given situation. And sometimes that means God allows an illness to remain for a person's good. And sometimes that mean, means God will remove the illness for the sake of his glory. That's why James encourages the church to call on the elders to pray over people because they are going to be more mature often in their faith and they will be able to discern the mind of Christ in a given situation to know what God is doing and how to pray for that individual. James also wants us to seek others to pray for us because sometimes the issue that we're asking prayer for is a result of the loving discipline of a father in heaven. You see that at the end of verse 15? If he's committed sins... He will be forgiven. Now, this isn't the idea of karma where uh, if something bad is happening to you, that means that you've done something wrong. However, there are times where the suffering we face are a result of the discipline of our Heavenly Father. And it's helpful when we bring our cares before each other to consider, is this in my life because God is trying to change something in me? Is there something that needs refining? And that's why I am facing this. Elders here in the church, for those of you that pray for those as they come to you, I would encourage you as they bring their suffering to you to ask them, is there any unrepentant sin in your life? If not, praise God and pray for them. But if so, work through that with them. Don't be afraid to talk about sin with somebody who's suffering. Because sometimes God wants to use that as a tool to refine them. And so bring that topic up as you pray for one another. So we ought to pray in all circumstances and enlist other people as we pray. Well, why? Why should we do this? Because prayer works. Look what James goes on to say in verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. In light of the effectiveness of prayer, James uh, says we should be regularly engaged in confession and prayer with each other. It's going to be what's best for our spiritual and physical health. In other words, in order for a church to maintain a clean bill of health, a church must constantly confess sin and pray for each other. Right? An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, for the church, bending God's ear keeps the great physician near, Right? We ought to pray for the health of the church. We ought to do it. Prayer is the single most powerful tool in the toolbox of a righteous person, right? What does James say? He says that the prayer of a righteous man has great power. It's powerful. It's not just anybody 
or anybody's prayers that will work, right? Prayer in general doesn't work. It is prayer of a righteous person that works. What does that mean? Does that mean that the, the prayers of the pastors and the elders of the prayer of Pastor Paul is going to be more effective than everybody else's prayers? Is, is it that those kind of priest, pastor sort of people are the ones whose prayers really matter and we're supposed to go to them for prayer? No, that's not what James means. A righteous person is anybody who has received the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for them. They are made righteous in Christ. So Pastor Paul's prayers do not carry any more weight than yours if you have received the same sacrifice Paul has. Jesus did not die to give you and I a fresh start. He didn't die to, clean, uh, to give us a clean slate. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he made an exchange. He exchanged his perfect righteousness, his perfect record with our wicked rap sheet. And we traded spots. He didn't just wipe us clean. He also gave his, us his track record. He made you and I, as we've trusted in Jesus, he made us as righteous as he is. See, our, our, our prayers are powerful not because of ourselves, because, but because of the righteousness we've received in Jesus Christ. James uses Elijah as an example when he prayed for drought and then he prayed for the rain to come back. He was a regular human being like us and he was made righteous by his own faith. And our, our, our prayers can be powerful because we're banking on the one who is powerful and the one who's given us his righteousness. And so our prayers can even change weather patterns. We were in the Amazon about 12 years ago. Uh, we went down there to, to build a, a church building for a, a little village that was down there. And we went down during their... Uh, dry season. I don't know if you knew this, but the Amazon River actually does have a dry season to where it only rains like once a week instead of every day. And so we were down there during this time and we brought all these water filters and we had started using the rain water that the village had collected and filtering that for a drink. But there was a big team and we were going through it pretty quick. And so we thought, hey, let's go ahead and use the Amazon River and filter that water to drink. And we did that and destroyed most of our filters in one one go, because the water is basically just thick mud moving down. And so we had some of our groups took an entire day, just sat down and say, God, would you open up the heavens and give us water so that we can continue to drink so we can finish this project over the next couple weeks? And guess what happened the next day? It rained. And guess what happened the day after that? It rained. And guess what happened the day after that? It rained. It rained every single day we were down there. We were down there for like three weeks. And it's only supposed to rain once a week. It rained so much that everything was flooding to where we're having to work in water up to our kneecaps because God had been so faithful to give us what we need. Our prayers could even direct weather patterns. And our prayers are powerful not because we're anything, but because Christ has made us righteous and supercharged our prayers so that they work. So if you have true faith this morning, a faith that works, you ought to be motivated to constant prayer because your prayers will work. Do you think the Father listens to the pleas of his righteous son? He does. And whose righteousness do you have? His. And so the Father will listen to your pleas. He will listen to your call, and he will answer, and he will respond. But friend, if you're here this morning, have you not received the forgiveness Jesus Christ offers you through his death, then you need to understand this morning that your prayers do not work. You might feel as when you're lying in bed at night and you pray, you feel like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. They are. It is because you do not... You, you are not righteous enough to be heard by God. But friend, you can be heard by God if you come through someone else's righteousness, Jesus, Jesus Christ. And so if you would like to receive the forgiveness God offers you through his son Jesus, you can talk to any of the, the people you saw standing up here earlier. You can hunt me down. 
I'd love to share with you how you can trust in Christ. And you can also take part in the power of prayer. James has one final encouragement before he closes his letter. Verse 19, he says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. In our prayers for one another, we should pay particular attention and concern for those who've wandered, for those who were once walking with us but have now departed. And James says, pray for those people because as God hears those prayers, he may turn them back. And so you might be a parent this morning and your kids, you raised them in this church and they were apart and now they've departed. What does James tell you to do? Pray for them. And remember, God hears your prayers like he hears the prayers of his own son and so continually petition before him, bring my son back, bring my daughter back to you, Father. You might have a friend or a neighbor or just another person you used to walk with that, that was here, that was a part of the Christian experience in this church, and they're gone. Pray for them. There is still hope. It is not too late. The Father can hear and the Father can turn them back. Take up this great responsibility, knowing your prayers made righteous by the blood of Jesus work. They work. In the spirit of James's encouragement earlier in the letter to not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers also, I want to give you just a couple of things this morning before we close. Something you can do and put into practice even this morning to live out what James is calling us to do. As Christians, I found that we're pretty good about asking each other for, for prayer requests, right? I mean, on Facebook, we do that pretty well. Hey, I need prayer for this or other such a thing. So we're pretty good about asking for prayer usually, right? You know what I find we're not that good at? Actually praying for each other when we make those requests, right? So you might be out here, you're getting a coffee, talking with someone, they're like, hey, I'm really struggling with this particular uh, illness. And you say, oh, man, I will pray for you. Then you both say, all right, bye. You get your cars, you go home, and you never do it. You never do it. And so here's what I found to be really helpful. When someone asks you for prayer, guess what you should do? Stop right then and say, can I pray with you right now about that? And pray with them. Guess what's going to happen? You're, you're both going to be encouraged like crazy for doing that. So don't ever, don't ever allow yourself to say, yeah, I will pray with you without just stopping right there and doing it. That's super helpful for me because I have the memory of a goldfish. Someone says, hey, hey, Glenn, will you pray for me on this? I'll say, yeah, I will totally do that. And then, oh, something shiny. And I go after that. So stop in the moment and pray with that person. And remind, and, and as you ask people for prayer, update them, right? Tell them, hey, God answered your prayer. Or keep praying for this particular thing. But stop in that moment and pray. One other thing you can do is write it down. Uh, I use this uh, Evernote, which is a program I use on my, my iPad, but you can use a lot of things. You can use a pencil and paper. Write down people's prayer requests and continually pray for them and revisit them. That helps you remember things. And it also helps you kind of go back and see how God's answered prayer. Sometimes we pray for things, God answers, and we forgot that we prayed for the thing. And it's kind of helpful to go back over your track record to see the things that you were praying for and how God chose in his grace and his mercy to respond. I think another point of application this morning as we look at this text is, if you're suffering this morning, if you're facing some kind of trial, some kind of sickness, I would encourage you, I know we had this awesome opportunity up here earlier in the service, but I would encourage you, seek out an elder and continue to do that. Right? James has opened up their job responsibility to pray for the church, not just in the service, but whenever we call on them to do so. Notice, I mean, sometimes people do this. They get upset that the leadership of the church might not be praying for them in a, in a certain issue. But, but who does James put the responsibility on to, to make sure the prayer happens? The individual, right? If he's sick, if anyone's sick, then let him ask for the elders to come. And I can tell you this right now, just from knowing Paul's heart and knowing uh, just from those I've met this morning, they would be happy to come pray for you. And plus, it's in their job description, right? That's what God wants them to do. And so don't be hesitant. Don't say, oh, no, this is not something that concerns them. No, ask them for prayer and they would be happy to come and pray for you. Use that opportunity God has provided for you 
this morning. Finally, we should remind each other to pray in the times of pain and in the times of joy. The Bible calls on us to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice. And part of that ought to be our praying for each other. And so when you have a, a brother or sister in Christ that is dealing with something and they're telling you about something that they are struggling with, you should use that as an opportunity right then to say, brother, can I pray with you right now about this? Sister, I know this is weighing heavy on you. Let me pray with you about this. Or, or you get the phone call and they say, oh, guess what happened? And they're super excited. Guess what you should do? Let's, let's thank God for that right now. Let, let's, let's tell God how good he is for giving this good thing to you. We should use our mutual experiences as opportunities to pray for one another and to encourage each other, right? So your friend calls you up and says, hey, I got a promotion. Great. Let's pray about it. Or your granddaughter, she calls, she's really upset, discouraged, because she just found out she's got to now wear braces. You should pray for her. Pray with her about that, that she wouldn't be discouraged. Your roommate just got engaged. Awesome. Rather than get jealous, pray with her. Sit down and say how great God has done this for you. When you get the call from your friend and her spouse has been diagnosed with cancer, drive over there and pray with them. Use our pain and our joys to pray for one another. And the more we pray, remember to pray with each other, the more we will remember to pray ourselves. And the more we will cultivate a prayer culture in this church that will lead to a clean bill of spiritual health here. Isn't that what you want in this church? That we would be honoring God through our lifting each other up in prayer. And so I'd encourage you this morning, church, set yourself to this great work. Offer each other up before our living God that we might be spiritually and physically healed to be able to walk and honor him in his kingdom and make a dent in this world for the sake of the gospel. Amen? Let's pray. Father, what a marvel it is that you would see in your plan or that you would design in your plan that your people would be able to offer up requests to you. That you were not distant, doing your own thing, doing your own plan without any regard to us, but God, that you would say, join me in what I'm doing and ask me of things. Seek me out, bend my ear and see what I can do. Father, I pray this morning that we'd see as we are trusting in you as our, our faith is working itself out, God, that it, one of the ways it would work itself out is in prayer, that we would see how much prayer works. Father, I pray you would bless this church, that this would be a church that is known for getting on its knees, constantly asking God to do amazing things. God, would you stop us dead in our tracks when we run on our own course without seeking you and bathing everything we do in prayer? Father, I pray especially this morning for those suffering and in pain that their knee-jerk reaction would be to have their knees hit the floor. And Father, I pray for those rejoicing that their voice would be filled with praises before you as their God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.